So let's pray quick, and we'll dig in. Lord Jesus, thank you so much. Uh, Lord, for who you are. Lord, I thank you that already, as uh, Bobby was just mentioning when we were talking up here at the podium, that uh, uh, already just in reading scripture, we've heard three times from you, and of course the worship was filled with you and some words from your scripture, and a lot of that will tie into what we were talking, are going to talk about today. So Lord, just pray for open hearts, Lord, that we would desire to be changed from the inside out by you for all of eternity, and Lord, you would just give me your words and not mine, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. Okay, first of all, I think it is important when you come to church or a Bible study, that you have a Bible that you can follow along with. We have a lot of Bibles, so if you can read and you can hear my voice and you do not have a Bible, please read, raise your hand and a couple guys will grab one for you. And it's okay to use your phone. That's what I do when I'm not teaching. Um, but we should, have, uh, we should have our Bibles in front of us. I also suggest taking notes, but... That's up to you. You might have a better memory than me. I am old. When you get your Bibles and you get them open, turn to Romans 14, please. Um, and I'm going to do a quick review through the book of Romans. Okay, uh, who wrote the book? Paul. Oh, where was Paul when he wrote? Or, I'm sorry, who did he write the book to? To Rome. The church in Rome, the Christians. And does anybody know where he was when he wrote this book? Everybody wants to say jail. That's not true. Sorry. Um, he was probably, they think, in the town of Corinth. Cor Cor I would say Corinth. And he was not, believe it or not, arrested during that time. It was actually during his third missionary journey when he was not imprisoned. Okay. Um, the church there was made up of many different, I'll call them nationalities, a couple different religions. And most notably, there were a lot of former Jewish Jewish by birth, but no longer Jewish by religion, who'd been converted to Christianity, what we today call Messianic Jews. And there was also a bunch of heathens, Gentiles, that had gotten saved. And were, that was the biggest mix. There were others as well that were in this church. And guess what that caused in their church? Troubles, divisions, issues. Wow, does that remind you of anything? People, today's church, right? There's nothing new under the sun, right? Um, and uh, he wrote this letter to them, but the cool thing is, is that God preserved his letter that was written way back then, so about 2,000 years ago, for us today, for the reason that he knows that we need it, right? When, uh, we, when we think about the, the Bible and why God wrote it, one of the things that we cannot nor should we expect is for that the world to listen to or follow God and or his world. Did anybody read God's word and follow it before you became a believer? I mean, you might have followed some rules that your church, denomination told you church, do, but you weren't reading it for yourselves in order to become more like Jesus, right? Those who don't know the Lord are slaves of this world, Satan, and sin, and they have no choice but to live a life of sin that unless they turn to Christ, when they die, they'll go to hell. This should give us an urgency to share the love of Jesus with everyone around us. But to those of us who call ourselves Christians, we have God's word. I like to use the acronym for Bible, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. Does that make sense? Easy to remember, right? We have it so that we can grow in our knowledge of the Lord, so that we can become more like him then others will see Jesus in us and notice the difference between us and them so that at the least they might notice that difference and ask us about it and more hopefully come to know Jesus like we know Jesus, right? Paul is not saying anywhere in his scriptures, that he, the letters he wrote, anything against anyone who is not a Christian and we shouldn't as Christians either. I can't imagine saying something negative about how a non-Christian lives their life, whether it's a politician or your neighbor or your co-worker, and if they heard that, that that would draw them to Christ. It will actually do the opposite. And we need to remember that, especially during the political season that we seem to always be in these days. Paul's concern in ours should be how each of us do or don't live for the Lord and then we should also be concerned about those who are in our circle as believers. 
This is why it's so important for us to go to church, to have fellowship with each other, and that includes studying God's word together, and this is not just a once a week thing. If you think just coming here to Sunday mornings is all that the Christian life is about, then you haven't read much of your Bibles. This is what Jesus calls discipleship, and you can turn over if you want to in Matthew 28, 19, and 20. I'm actually going to read it from the Amplified Version. I like that. It kind of explains it more, but if I read through the Amplified every day, I would never get through the Bible in but about 10 years because it does explain it a little bit more, but I'm going to read it in Amplified. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. So first of all, that word go is what we call an imperative. An imperative in the English language means you don't have a choice. And not only don't you have a choice, but you need to do it now. Does that make sense? It's like you're walking through the streets of New York City, and your little five-year-old goes to run out into the traffic, and you say, stop, and you grab your hand. That's the same meaning that this word go has, and it's written to us as believers. So as believers, we need to go and make disciples of all nations. In parentheses, it says, help the people to learn of me, capitalize Jesus, believe in me, and obey my words. Okay, that's what making disciples is. Baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit, verse 20, teaching them to observe everything that I have commanded you. Where do we find that? In the Bible, right? Every, the whole Bible written by Jesus, right? Holy Spirit, God, Jesus, all the same, right? So that's where we find. It's not what I think. It's not what you think. It's not what religion teaches you. It's what God has, has given us in his word. And then he says, Lord, I'm with you always, parenthesis again, remaining with you perpetually regardless of circumstance and on every occasion all the way to the end of the age. As with most, if not all, Paul's letters, he begins in Romans by talking about all the Lord has done for us, and at some point he gets to that therefore statement. I've never found one of Paul's letters that didn't do that when he's writing them to the churches. Right? He, he, he does what? He gives us the doctrine first, and then he says, boom, because of all that the Lord has done for you, Christian, therefore... You need to be doing this. Does that make sense? Um, I know we're going to be in Romans 14, and this was taught a couple weeks ago by Bobby. But just flip back to Romans 12 a couple pages, because this is Paul's therefore in the book of Romans. right? So he takes the first 11 chapters of Romans, and he gives us all this doctrine, all the wherefores, all the stuff that we need to learn as believers that Paul was teaching the Roman church, and again, God, God preserved it for us. And then he gets to chapter 12 all the way through 15, and he tells us what we should be doing with our lives in light of all that God did for us. So, verse 1, therefore, I urge you, okay, urging. Can you imagine the Apostle Paul being timid in his word, urge? Okay, that was not Paul. You know anything about Paul? If Paul urged you, it was like, you need to do this. Get busy. You need to do this. You need to do this, right? Brethren, the believers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. In short, what he's saying here is, because of all the stuff I just told you, what else would you do except for serve the Lord? Now, if you're not a believer, just ignore what I'm saying. But if you're a believer, that is the natural outcome of what the Lord has done for us. And he tells us part of what to do in that in verse 2, and do not be conformed to this world. Okay, so what does that mean? It means that we're not supposed to act like the world. It means that we are supposed to be acting like Jesus, right. And then he says, okay, so if I'm not going to conform to the world, because that's the way I was born, right? Nobody had to teach me how to be conformed to the world. What I had to learn was how to be conformed to Jesus. And how do we do that? The next sentence. By being transformed by the renewing of our mind. We need to start taking our minds, and we start, need to start thinking differently. If I'm going to think like the world, guess what? I'm going to act like the world. If I'm going to think like Jesus thought, if I'm going to do what Jesus did, if I'm going to act like Jesus did, now I'm no longer 
doing what the world does. I'm doing what the Lord wants me to do. And then he finishes that verse by saying, so that you may prove what the will of God is. I hear so many people say, I don't know God's will. I don't know God's will. Guess what? He just told you right here. That's what God's will is, right? That which is good and acceptable and perfect. So the past few weeks, there's several times that we went over a lot of the stuff in those first couple chapters, and hopefully you were here. I'm not going to get into all that, but I just wanted to start with a therefore and again reiterate that none of us should have to be forced as believers to do what the Lord has called us to do, right? And why do we do it? Because he first loved us, right? So Romans 14, we'll start by reading verses 1 through 3. I read out of the NASB, so I'm, I'm sure whatever version you have will be close to that, so we'll read on. Now accept the one who is weak in faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment on his opinions. One person has faith that he may eat all things, but he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt the one who does not eat, and the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. So Paul's mindset was one thing, to be obedient to the Lord, and then he wrote his letters to help us do the same. Jesus told us in John 14, 15, I'll read this again out of the Amplified, if you really love me, so really love me, in other words, you're not just saying, God is love, I love Jesus, I know Jesus, uh, but if you really love me, you will keep and obey my commandments. And once again, where do we find Jesus' commandments? In the Word, right? So as we're reading through this passage, we need to understand that Paul is not changing anything that Jesus and the rest of God's Word has told us to do and not do. So again, Paul is not talking about what we might call the essentials of the faith, doctrine, and biblical principles. That is not what this passage is talking about. Give you a quick history regard, regarding eating meat. I personally am a vegan because my cow eats vegetables and I eat my cow, therefore I am a cow. I'm um, sorry, I eat vegetables, I guess I should have said. But, but during Paul's day, it was different. First of all, there are some Jews. They were told they couldn't eat certain meats, right? And then there were also a lot of other things that were going on with having to do, do with whether people would eat meat or not. But one thing is for sure they, they were not eating meat because of, he wasn't talking about people not eating meat because of health-related issues or climate-related preferences, which is so prevalent today. So uh, the Lord told Peter in Acts 10, 9 to 15, that basically we could eat anything. Hallelujah. I love bacon. So anyways, if you don't, I'm sorry. Um, while this was a big issue back then, it's not one now. But God gave us this example, not so we could point out, don't eat meat, eat vegetables. It's a basic biblical principle that we can take and apply to all areas of our lives. There's many areas where one person thinks something different about something than we do. And it is not an essential of the faith. So again, we're talking about stuff that's not essential in the faith. And I could give you a list, but I won't. Well, just look at this as a biblical principle that we can apply to many areas of our lives. Paul talks about a Christian who is weaker than another. When we think of the word weak as less than, when we think of the word weak, we think it's someone who's less than I am. Does that make sense? You're weaker than me because I can lift more weights than you or whatever we want to talk about. Um, so, but we know that Paul is talking to believers, so let me ask you this question. Does any of us have more Jesus than any other believer? Is there anything we can do to have more of Jesus or less of him? There is? No. <laughs> I mean, once Jesus is in us, he's in us, right? He doesn't just say, you know, hey, I'm going to give you half of me. And, oh, you messed up. You can only have half of me today. So that's what I'm about. We can choose not to listen to him and follow him, but the Holy Spirit is still living in us, right? Um, he hasn't given us or made himself 100% available to all, believe, to all who believe in him all the time. I hope I said that right. So not more or less than one over the other. Paul says that one who lives according to the rules that aren't essentials is the weaker Christians. Okay, so if I've made some kind of rule that I'm going to follow and I think you're going to follow, I think that you're weaker because you're not following them. 
But who does Paul say is the weaker one here? The one who's making the rules. So, so I think if we, if we look at things, we would probably think that, you know what, we're all weaker than someone else, right? We can also think that he's talking to a new believer here, someone who doesn't know any better. And that could be the case, but it's not always. Maybe someone just decided to make changes in their lives because they think it'll make them feel closer to Jesus. And again, I'm not talking about essentials of the faith, but we know God's word doesn't say that. Honestly, if we'd all just get involved with discipleship, which like I said is more than just coming to church on a Sunday, we could all be digging deeper into God's word in a more intimate way so we could help each other grow in the Lord and help equip one another for the life that God has for us here on this earth. I personally, I know I'm weak. And I think if you're honest with yourself, you'd say the same thing. If I think I've got it all down, it can overcome any instant obstacle that comes my way that I'm probably being too prideful. And what does Proverbs 16, 18 say about that? Pride comes before a fall, right? There are things that I know that I can't be around that may cause me to fall into sin. When I first got saved, um, I guess I'll just tell you quick, I was a drug addict. I did a lot of things I shouldn't have been doing for many years. And when I first got saved, I couldn't hang around with those same people. I couldn't go to them same places. I tried for a little bit, lived both ways, and it didn't work. I was not walking with the Lord. I was being conformed to the world, right? So, I, you know, that was uh, 30 years ago. So uh, I'm, I don't, I'm no longer tempted by some certain things, but there's still, still things that I struggle with that I know I need to stay away from because it could lead me into sin, okay? Are there things in your life that you could say the same about? And if so, then you, like me, are weak in some areas. Everybody's different. But there's also, we also know from uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13, that there's no temptation taking you, but such is common to man. So in other words, you know what? There's somebody else out there that's being tempted the same way you are. And the good news about that verse is God promises he won't let us be tempted so that we have to sin. And I'll get into sin here in a couple minutes. Knowing I'm weak causes me to want to be in God's word multiple times daily. I know that if I don't pay closer attention to what I've heard, that I could end up dripping away, as Paul told us in Hebrews 2.1. Because of this, I try to start each day in God's Word, to listen to good teaching while I'm doing my PT every morning, to listen to podcasts throughout the day while I'm working, and to watch several good teachings during the week with Mary Jo. We both look for any opportunity we can to help us not drift away because we realize we are weak. Being weak is also one of the reasons we need to be involved in discipleship, teaching, etc. with others. We need to be one another Christians. So back to Romans, we're down to verse 4 now. Who are you to judge a servant of another? To his own master, he stands or falls, and he will stand, for the Lord is able to make him stand. So I know a lot of you have different versions. You can look up many versions. Depending on what your version says there, Paul says we're not to judge. But a better way to put that is we're not to argue with the weak person on his opinions. Again, what we call non-essentials. We're also told in verse 3 that we're not to look down on those who are weak. He then tells, us the, ve he tells the vegans that they aren't to judge someone because they eat meat. The one who eats meat is no more a Christian than the vegan and vice versa. Vice versa, Faith in Christ alone by his grace makes me a Christian and there's no difference for anybody else. As believers, Jesus is our master and he is the one who judges our hearts, our minds, and our motives. He judges what we do on this earth with all that he's given us. There's some parables that Jesus talked about in the Bible. He talked about the one in Matthew 7, 24 to 27, about building our houses upon the foundation of the rock, which is Christ. Okay? Talked about another one in Matthew 6, 19 to 21. He told us that we're not to be storing up for ourselves treasures on this earth, but rather store up for ourselves treasures in heaven. And then finally, one of my favorite ones, Matthew 25, 14 to 30, where Jesus told the parable about the master who was leaving and gave his three servants talents. He gave what's called money back then. And he gave each one a different amount based on what he knew they could handle. 
And then he went away, but then he came back. And when he came back, he called them an account of, the, of, of all that they had done with what he had given them. So those are just a few examples of Jesus explaining what we're to do on this earth, and that also goes along with what Paul told us in Romans 12, which we already read. As Christians, we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ, according to Paul in 2 Corinthians 5. I know there's a lot of confusion about that, and a lot of Christians will do not know, believe, or understand that God has told us as Christians, when we get to heaven, he will judge us. Now, first of all, that's not the judgment between heaven and hell, whether you're going to go to hell or not. This is what we term the Bema seat, and it's a reward-type judgment, like what happens in the Olympics. We are rewarded for what we did on this earth with all that the Lord has given us. But here's the difference. We can each come in first place because it's not based on what I do compared to what you do. It's based on what the Lord gave me the ability to do and what I did with it, not for me, not even really for my family in some cases, but what I've done for him with what he gave for me. And guess what? My family will get blessed. My employer will get blessed. My employees will get blessed. Because if I'm doing what I'm supposed to do with everything that God has given me, then there's no way I can be not taking care of other people. Does that make sense? It really comes down to who your master is. And Jesus said, you know, they're, they're my servants. They're not, they're not yours, okay? Just take care of me, okay? So then we have to ask yourself, well, who's my master? Is it me or is it Jesus? And I know, and people have told me this about rewards in heaven, I don't care. I made it to heaven. That's good enough. Well, guess what? Myself, I care. I care for me. Okay, I'm involved in discipleship and teaching and sharing God's word with people because I also care for you, right? So if you're in my circle and, and like what we are today, right? And, and the, the other thing is, obviously Jesus cares about us doing that or it wouldn't be in his word. If Jesus was just like, hey, say a prayer, get to heaven, do whatever you want, we wouldn't have it. There'd be no need to read the Bible. There'd be no need to come to church. There'd be no reason to have fellowship and discipleship. And some of these passages are already, are already talked about, and then many more, including what Paul told us in Philippians 3.14. He said, I press on towards the prize that God has called me, heavenward in Christ Jesus. Okay, Paul pressed on. I don't know anybody in the New Testament, in my opinion anyways, who had a harder life and did more for the gospel than Paul. Paul wrote almost a quarter of the New Testament and that God kept for us. So he must be so important, he never stopped. He never stopped until they with him, right? According to Romans, we also don't get to judge others based on the non-essentials of the faith. So again, we're not talking about judging about the non-essentials. Uniformity in non-essentials is not imperative for us to fellowship as believers. I'm going to read that again. Uniformity in non-essentials is not imperative for for us to fellowship as believers. Sadly, though, we often make it that way. I know what me and Mary Jo do with disaster relief and stuff. We not only work with all kinds of denominations and Christians, but guess what? We work with a lot of non-Christians, too. Honestly, when I go out to help people, I'm looking for more people that don't know Jesus than are. Local church should be taking care of their people. I'm coming in to help be a witness for the Lord. Not that I won't help those other people, but I try to make my priority to reach the lost for Christ, right? So, verses 5 and 6 in Romans. One person regards one day above another. Another regards every day alike. Each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. He who observes the day observes it for the Lord, and he who eats does so for the Lord. For he gives thanks to God. And he who eats not for the Lord, he does not eat. And he also gives thanks to God. So here Paul's talking about one day being celebrated more than another. Paul doesn't tell us what that day is or days are, right? But most think it was the Sabbath he was talking about. And also keeping other Jewish festivals, religious feasts and stuff, right? But we need to remember something. First of all, most of the Jewish festivals were meant for the Jews to remember the things that had been done for them by the Lord. 
but they were all meant in everything that the Lord did for them to point them to Jesus. It's okay to know about the festivals and the feast, but since Jesus fulfilled everything, then there's no reason that we have to practice them. You want to do it? You want to know about it? Have at it. But it's not going to change your salvation. There's, we should be focusing more on the things we're supposed to do than the things that are of less importance. Again, it doesn't, make, doesn't mean we can't, don't need to know about them. They're in the Bible. I try to study through the Bible once a year. I never make it, but I just keep going. But, but, but I'm not going to focus my life on that because that's not going to help me live for the Lord today. That's why I like Paul's epistles. I love reading through them and teaching through them. We just need to remember all that the Lord did for us and told us to do and not to do in his word, which is, again, why it's imperative for us to be in the word, in prayer, and in discipleship. And here's some trivia for you. Did you know that the Sabbath is the only of the Ten Commandments that we are not told to do in the New Testament? I didn't know that till recently. So, and I looked it up. I didn't believe it when somebody told me. And sure enough, it's not in there, all right? Mark, we're told, Jesus told us in Mark, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Okay, so the Sabbath, quick history, is made for man to rest after working six days. Anybody want to go to a six-day work week? Not me. <laughs> all right, it started at sunset on Friday and went all the way to sunset on Saturday, and there were, it was a whole lot more to it than just not working and going to church. So if you want to keep it, if you're like, hey, we need to keep the Sabbath, you better research what that means, and then you better do that, or you better keep your mouth shut. Because if you ain't following what it said, just not working on Friday and Saturday is not what keeping the Sabbath in the Old Testament was about. More than likely, attempting to follow and obey all the laws and keep the festivals were only revealed to us that we can't which is why the Lord gave it to us in the first place. This just reveals the sin in our lives and our need for a Savior, Jesus. I'm not going to look down on you for keeping it if you want, and you can't judge me for not keeping it according to these verses. Praise the Lord. We get to worship and serve the Lord every day, not just on a Sabbath day. Our rest is in Jesus, and our rest was fulfilled when he died and rose again. By the way, if you think the promised land was God's rest for the Israelites, you again do not know your Bible. They had to fight, fight, fight to get the land. And maybe God did. God did a lot to help them get it on their own, but they all still had a lot that they had to do as well. And it was many, 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 even, I think it even took 500-ish years for them to finally get the city of Jerusalem. David's the one that did that. Even the Israelites didn't conquer the city of Jerusalem, right? The important thing in all this is that if I'm convinced in my mind that I need to eat something or not eat it, if I need to keep a day or not keep it, then I better do it. But, it, but I also better be doing it for the Lord and not for me to be prideful or to put you down because I'm doing something that's a non-essential that I think you should be doing as well. Something else to remember if we think our conscience is telling us to do something or say something that is clearly against anything in God's word, you and me are dead wrong. If it does not match up with scripture, I'm gonna if you say something like that to me, I'm going to tell you, show me it in the Bible. And I've said that to many people and over the years. And you know what? They always have an excuse why they can't show me. And they've yet to come back and show me. I'm not saying that I haven't been learned things or seen things that I didn't see in the Bible before. Like the thing about the Sabbath, that was new to me, that it wasn't in the New Testament. I mean, it is, but not in like, hey, you need to keep the Sabbath. But you know what? If it's not in there and you're trying to force it on me or you're doing it yourself, what do we call that? It is a sin, right? So speaking of our conscience, guess what? We all have one. This is our hearts, minds, and souls being directed by the Holy Spirit in our lives. I know a guy taught on that a couple weeks ago. 
While studying for this teacher, there were some things that I started writing down. Sometimes this will happen. I do a lot of uh, devos and posts on Facebook, and, and I talk with a lot of people around the country in like a ministry kind of way and, and praying for them and stuff. And sometimes I'll start to write something, and I will feel something inside of me, and, and I can't explain it, but it ain't a good feeling. And I'm like, hmm. Maybe I'm not supposed to say that. And I reread it, and I go, oh, yeah, I probably shouldn't say that. At least not right now kind of thing. And that happened to me just the last few days when I was preparing for today's sermon. There are some things that I said, oh, can't do that. And I do mine on a computer, so I just backspace, you know, copy and paste, whatever, and it's gone, right? For a non-believer, the Holy Spirit does not reside in them. But he is still in the world, convicting of sin in their lives in a way that reveals to them who he is so that they will turn to him. For believers, we have all, as we talked about before, the Holy Spirit living inside of us for basically two reasons, okay? The first thing is that he is guaranteeing us, he's given us the hope that we have in Jesus of eternity in heaven with the Lord, okay? So no matter what you've done, no matter what you think, no matter what may, somebody else may be telling you, no matter whatever Satan is wor- whispering in your ear, if you are a believer, you're still going to heaven. Do you deserve it? Nope. <laughs> I know I don't. I don't know about you. So, so but what we have to remember is what did Jesus promise us, not what did I do or not do that Satan might be trying to convince me that I'm not a Christian. And the other thing is, along those lines, is that's just like what I was talking about, is the Holy Spirit is inside of us, prompting us to do the right thing or not do the wrong thing, right? He helps us live a life for the Lord and not to sin, and therefore making us continually more like Jesus. Quick note on the word subconscious. Guess what? It's not in the Bible, okay? Nowhere, okay? Doing normal things that are habits that you don't have to think about how we do, like walking isn't the same as sinning and saying, oh, I must have done that in my subconscious. No. When I sin, I know I'm sinning. I'm not three anymore. I didn't just get saved yesterday. So anybody here that has been saved more than yesterday and and is not three you know when you are sinning, or you just totally ignore the Holy Spirit. You don't get into the Word, you know, spend any time in fellowship or prayer. That's a sin anyways, so start doing something about it, right? We can never, ever make an excuse for our sins. And you guys can argue with me about that later if you want. Not now. Down to verse 7 to 9. For not one of us lives for himself, and no one dies for himself. For if we live, we live for the Lord. Or if we die, we die for the Lord. Therefore, whether we live or die, we are the Lord's. For this end, Christ died and lived again, that he might be Lord both of the dead and the living. So guess what? Newsflash. Life on this earth is not about living or dying for me, myself, and I. Same thing for you. We're to be living for the Lord. Paul, Paul told us in Philippians 1, 21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Jesus is Lord of all. He's in charge of everything no matter what anyone else does or doesn't do. That includes politicians, by the way. We should want to live for him, and then when we die, we'll join him in heaven forever. That's the important stuff that we need to remember. Verses 10 through 13, but you are, Why do you judge your brother? Or you again, why do you regard your brother with contempt? For we will all stand before the judgment seat of God. Okay, we already talked about that, but here again, Paul is saying, who's he talking to? Right, right. So if you don't believe you're going to get judged when you get to heaven, then you got to scratch this verse out, right? Don't do that. For it, it is written, as I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me and every tongue shall give praise to God. So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore. And again, Paul here is talking about non-essentials, okay? Paul again asks us, why do we criticize and look down on our Christian brothers and sisters? We are going to all stand before the judgment. He then quotes Isaiah 45, 23, and he also quotes that same verse in Philippians 2, 11, where he admonishes admonishes them to be obedient to the Lord, whether he's with them or not. 
we will all bow to the Lord. Here he doesn't distinguish between which person he's talking to because both people, so you know, the one that's making the rules and trying to keep them and the one that doesn't care about the rules that you made and is not going to keep them, he, he doesn't distinguish here in this part, right? He's talking to both of them because more than likely, whatever side of that fence you're on, you're going to be judging the other person. At least that's what I do. Judging, judging each other, criticizing each other, putting each other down, thinking better of ourselves as someone who is weak, etc., is not loving them. Honestly, and you can ask Mary Jo, she will vouch for me on this one. I got enough to answer for myself when I bow before the Lord. I really don't need to be worrying about the non-essential stuff that the rest of y'all are doing. But that doesn't mean we don't disciple because there is a huge difference. We can't be causing divisions in the church over the non-essentials. Uh, Paul warned us in Titus that we're supposed to avo avoid those kinds of conversations. And he says, hey, if there's someone in your church that's being divisive, warn them twice, warn them once, warn them twice, and then they got to go. All right? It's very important that we don't allow that inside the church, right? Over non-essentials. Okay, back to Romans, verses 13 through 15. Therefore, let us not judge one another anymore, but rather determine this, not to put an obstacle or a stumbling block in a brother's way. I know and am convinced in the Lord Jesus that nothing is unclean in itself. But to him who thinks anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. For because of food your brother is hurt, you are no longer walking according to love. Do not destroy with your food him for whom Christ died. So Paul told us instead of worrying about what someone else is doing, we need to make sure that there's nothing that we're doing that could be an obstacle or a stumbling block to another Christian. This includes criticizing and putting others down because we think they're weak or don't agree with them, again, over the non-essentials. I'm going to say that a hundred times today. Jesus said that it is not what goes into a man that makes him unclean, but what comes out of him. Paul also told us, um, actually Luke told us uh, that there that. Luke told us that Peter was told by the Lord that he made everything clean, right? And so therefore we can eat bacon or lobster or shrimp if you're not allergic to it. The most important principle here is that we are not to hurt another Christian or attempt to destroy their faith by anything we say and do, again, when it comes to the non-essentials. This can be applied to a lot of our so-called freedoms. To quote Indigo Montoya, the phrase stumbling block may not mean what you think it means. We just got to go watch that movie for the first time in our Packard Theater the other day. This isn't talking about possibly offending someone regarding their preferences. It's talking about doing something that could cause someone to be tempted to sin. Things like how we do worship. Do we dress up for church? These are preferences and aren't things that cause others to fall in sin. Honestly, I do not own a tie. I do not own a suit. I don't own any of that stuff. When my daughter got married, I had to walk her down. The, we were outside wedding, but I had to walk her down the aisle. And she had to tell Mary Jo what she wanted me to wear. And then we went out and bought it. And every stitch of clothes that I had on was brand new. I mean, I may have it somewhere, but that was the last time I wore anything like that, right? One time I got uninvited to speak to a church because you got to wear a suit and tie to be on their podium. I was like, mm, that's okay. And they understood. And they said, oh, sorry, we didn't even think to tell you that. And it was fine. They still paid for us to come up where they were. And <laughs> we met some of Mary Jo's relatives and had a, is over Christmas time. We had a good Christmas. But anyways, that's not keeping anybody out of heaven. You know, if, if you don't like our casual dress, uh, I mean, there's, there's even Calvary chapels I go to and speak at every once in a while. And a couple of them call me the flip-flop pastor. I mean, if it's cold outside, and you'll notice this about me here, I walk from my trail over to here in my flip-flops. You know, I'm still wearing pants and a jacket and, uh, you know, a sweater or a sweatshirt or something like that. But, you know, that's not for everybody. If it's not, then you know what? There's other good churches out there where that's what they do. But it's not going to make a difference whether you or I get into heaven, right? Unity and fellowship are key to our discipleship. Paul tells us that the body is made up of different parts in 1 Corinthians 12. We know from God's word that nothing or no one can put anything that for, can do anything to us that forces us to sin. James 1, 13 to 15 tells us where does sin come from? Anybody know? 
our thinking, our stinking thinking, I like to say. Ezekiel 18, 1 to 22, tells us that not even our upbringing, our genetics, our family, our culture, etc., can cause us to sin. I know in the Bible it talks about um, generational curses. God is not saying that you have to sin because your dad drank. What he's telling you is if your dad drinks, it's going to be a curse in your life because guess what? He's going to spend all his money on alcohol. He's going to spend all his money on drugs, on gambling. Whatever that is that he shouldn't be doing is going to affect your life and could affect even future generations after you. But if my dad, which my dad didn't, is doing the wrong thing, it's not an excuse for me to sin. Does that make sense? We all suffer the consequences of our own sin. That's a very biblical thing. You can find it all over the word. You can't just pick that one verse out about generation curses and say, guess what? I sin because this is the way God made me. I sin because this is the way I was raised. You, you can try, but you will get to heaven one day and have to answer for that. Back to our text. We are not to be part of anything that tempts others to sin. Again, I'd love to give you a list here, but I won't because I'd probably step on some toes and we'd be here for so long with that list that that's all we would have talked about this morning. We do have a lot of freedoms as Christians outside of clear biblical theology and principles. Hey, Paul told us in 1 Corinthians 10 that, hey, all things are lawful, but they're not all profitable. If it's not building somebody else up and it ain't building me and whoever else is around me up, guess what? That's not profitable. We may know someone in our circle who has struggled with something that may not lead us to sin. We might not even know that they struggle with it. But what happens if they do? And they see us do it, and our example leads them down a path to sin. That is exactly what this passage is saying. You may think that you're strong enough or you have a freedom to do whatever you want. And you really do but not when it is not loving someone else. That's where your freedom as a believer ends. What if they see us acting and doing things that they don't think is right for a Christian to do, and it causes them to walk away from the Lord completely because they think we're just like the rest of the world? If that's just the way it is, you can say, I didn't force them to sin. Well, ask yourself, would this be the loving thing that you need to do according to the word? Would this be dying to ourselves and taking up our cross? 16 to 23. Therefore, do not let what is for you a good thing be spoken of as evil. For the kingdom of God is not eating and drinking, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Spirit. For he who is this way serves Christ, for he who in this way serves Christ is acceptable to God and approved by men. So then we pursue the things which make for peace and the building up one another. Read that again. So then we pursue, Christians pursue, the things which make for peace and building up one another. If you, if you want to ignore everything that I've been saying about what you should and shouldn't do without getting into specifics that aren't essential to the faith, please scratch that out of your Bibles because you wouldn't be listening to this, right? Do not tear down the work of God for the sake of food. All things indeed are clean but they are evil for the man who eats and gives offense. It is good not to eat meat or to drink wine or to do anything by which your brother stumbles. He didn't say you can't eat meat. He said if it causes your brother to stumble. The faith which you have, have as your own conviction before God. Happy is he who does not condemn himself in what he approves. But he who doubts is con condemned if he eats because he is eating is not from faith and whatever is not from faith is sin. So Paul is telling us here that if there's a chance that another Christian can look at something we're doing and say it's not good, then we need to quit doing it. And guess what? This goes for both parties on the side of what he's talking about here. Again, to the non-essentials. Being happy seems to be all that this world is about these days. Things in this world will never satisfy us. Only Jesus can do that. God's kingdom isn't about things on this earth that we think we must have or must do. His kingdom involves righteousness and having his peace and joy based on him, not on what we have or what we do here. 
The more we know, obey, and follow Christ, the more we'll have true peace and joy on this earth. As we learned last week from Connor, we don't owe judgment to anywhere. Instead, we owe them love. And that word love is from the agape, so it's a sacrificial love, meaning it's, it's not about me, it's about you, right? Paul tells us that it is good for us not to do anything that may call our Christian brother or sister to be tempted to sin. He's not telling us that this is a law, and he's not giving us a list. But if we think it's okay for us to do everything we want because we're free, we're also needing to remember that we're to do all things to God's glory. We need to be fully convinced that when we stand before the Lord, that there will be no doubt that we did the right thing out of love for God and love for our Christian brothers and sisters. If there's something we're doing and we know that it could possibly cause someone else to sin, then we are sinning. We need to do whatever we can to help build up the body of Christ in our circle and quit focusing on ourselves and our rights. Guess what? A fall of Christ, you ain't got no rights. I don't have any rights, right? I gave them up when I made Jesus the Lord of my life. No matter what transpires, those in our circles who are Christians are first and foremost our brothers and sisters in Christ. We need to never forget that and remember that it will never change. We all need to be part of the discipleship process together and be part of each other's spiritual lives. It's way better for us to stick together and work through our walk with Jesus than to get mad and just do our own thing. Just a touch base on legalism in the church, it has no place. Being weak in the faith is not the same as giving me a bunch of rules that I must follow in order to follow Christ. As Jesus said, love God and love others. When we do this, we won't sin. In Philippians 1, 6, Paul tells us that God's not done with us and he will continue to make us more like the Lord as we walk in him. Paul also tells us that, tells us that God wants us to do good works that he prepared in advance for us to do, and that's from Ephesians 2.10. And finally, I'm going to read this verse. I'm going to read it out of the Message Bible. I like the way it puts it. This is Galatians 5.13. It is absolutely clear that God has called you to a free life. Just make sure that you don't use this freedom as an excuse to do whatever you want, want to do and destroy your freedom. Rather, use your freedom to serve one another in love. That's how freedom grows. For everything we know about God's word is summed up in a single sentence. Love others as you love yourself. That's an act of true freedom. If you bite and ravage each other, watch out. In no time at all, you will be annihilating each other. And where will your precious freedoms be then? We need to remember all that the Lord has done for us. His unconditional love when he died for us before we knew him and when we were still sinners. We can never repay the Lord for all he's done for us. But simple obedience to him and his word as best we can on this earth is a good start, and it's really all he asks of us. So this is the first Sunday of the month, and we're going to do communion. It's a chance to really think about what all the Lord has done for us and about how we need to show him how we love him by loving others. Do we obey him? Do we seek to be part of the body as we help, help build each other up? Do we serve him and serve others? Are we willing to do whatever he asks of us with our time, our money, and our things? I know these are hard things to think about, but I can't imagine how hard it was for Jesus to go on the cross and die for us. Guy's going to have uh, a few of the guys start passing out the elements, and uh, I need you guys to turn over to 1 Corinthians 11, 23 to 32. We're going to read through uh, Paul's exhortation on communion. I'll talk about it a little bit. But please hold on to the communion elements till we get to the end, and then I'll tell you what we're going to do next. So let's get over to 1 Corinthians 11, 12. Sorry, 1 Corinthians 11, 23. Most of you probably already know these verses. 
I'm going to talk about them anyways, because that's just what I do. I talk, I drink coffee, and I talk a lot. Lots of coffee, lots of talk, sorry. Good, strong coffee, too. Anyways, verse number 23. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So this is why we take communion, okay? It's not like what some religions say, it turned into the body of Jesus and turns into the blood of Christ. Not that. It's bread and it's juice. That's all it is, just bread and juice, okay? It doesn't magically transform into something else. But the reason we take it, it's to remember the body and the blood of Jesus about what he did for us. And again, in light of all that he's done for us, what are we going to do for him? So I'm going to read over in verse 27. <clears throat> Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, <clears throat> if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. That means they're, they've died. But if we judge ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are discipled by the Lord, so we will not be condemned along with the world. So what does all that mean? I've heard many different teachings on it. But here's what we know. The Bible was written to non-believers. No, it was written to believers, right? Does that mean that this passage was different? No, it doesn't, right? He wrote it to Corinthians and the believers in the Corinthian church. Did you get me? Thanks. Okay, so Paul is telling us Christians here that we need to each individually examine ourselves before we take communion. It's not to see whether or not you sinned, because guess what? We all sin. I'm sure that some of us sinned on the way to church today. Maybe somebody cut you off in traffic. Maybe your husband did something to upset you. Hey, Gabe. <clears throat> so it's not to see if we sinned or not. We've all sinned. Also, there's not a single one of us who is worthy of anything that the Lord has done for us and deserves that, right? So that's what we're remembering when we take communion about, what, about being sin, sinning and being worthy. So what do we need to do since we all know that we're not worthy and we're all sinners? We need to acknowledge our sin before the Lord. Not just to look good, but to truly repent of our sin, which means we're going to strive to quit sinning and instead run to God and do those things that he's called us to do. There's not a Christian here that should not be taking communion. Aren't we all here to hear from the Lord and allow him to make us more like Jesus? We need to, not, we need to quit making excuses for our sin and just do what we need to do about it. If as a Christian, according to Paul here, we take communion knowing that there's ongoing, persistent, unrepentant sin in our lives, then Paul is telling us that we're bringing condemnation into our lives. I need to tell you, first of all, it's not a condemnation that if you're living in sin, you're going to hell. Paul's not talking about that here. But what he, he's, he's not saying you're going to lead, lose your salvation. But we need to be careful because the Bible tells us that the Lord disciplines those he loves. This is a great time to make things right and then take communion. But if you're not a Christian, taking communion without being a Christian will not keep you out of heaven. Again, it's just grape juice and bread. Only denying Christ and not turning your life over to him will keep you out of heaven, and that choice will mean you'll spend eternity in hell. If you fall into that category, then simply ask God to reveal himself to you. Agree that you're a sinner and you don't want to live like that anymore. Ask him to come into your life to be Lord over all of you. He will, and then today could be the first time you really take communion. That'd be great. Okay, I think everybody's got it. Anybody not get it? 
So we're going to do something a little bit different today. I have only been here a short time. I don't know if you've ever done this before. But I want us to break up into small groups. Okay, like groups of you know, maybe four to six at the most. Okay, not just one or two, but small groups. Okay, so you'll be looking around you. If somebody around you, there's only one or two of you, go sit with somebody else. If, you're the, if you see someone near you, invite them into your group, okay? Okay, I want you to take a quick moment to pray for each other. If there's something specific, specific you need to pray for, then a brief couple seconds. We don't have time to go into all your history about what you're praying about, just the specific request, a synopsis. You can do that afterwards, but please not right now. Okay, let your group know, and then somebody pray for them right then and right there. So let's also not make this a social visit. We're not here to visit with each other. Again, you can do that afterwards. It's rather time to seriously seek the Lord together as a group. I'm sure that everyone has something to need prayer for, so be real with each other. If you don't know someone in your group, just say, hey, my name's Kurt. And then just if nobody has anything going on they want to pray for, then just pray in general. So we can take five or ten minutes to just pray for each other. This is also a great time if you don't know Jesus to ask for someone to pray for you and lead you in a prayer, or you can just pray to yourself. God, the angels, and all of us here are always excited when someone gives their life to the Lord. If you're a Christian and you, you're sitting here right now and you need to get something straightened with the Lord and possibly someone else who's here, then get up, go over to them, and do it now. Do not just take communion. You'll be bringing judgment on yourself, which means God's going to discipline you, right? This is body life. This is discipleship. And it's exactly what we're all called to do. After you've prayed, someone from each group can say a short prayer for the elements, and then you as a group will take it together. We're not going to do worship while we're doing this, but once Bobby senses that everybody's done, they'll come up here and they'll lead us out in worship. If you finish before everyone else, please remain in prayer for the others. Respect this time. Keep your movements to a, min a minimal until Bobby comes back up. I'm going to pray, and then we can get at it. Lord, I do thank you for your word, Lord, for your Holy Spirit, and Lord, most importantly, for what you did for us on Calvary. Lord, as we take this time to get together to pray for one another, Lord, and just to remember all that you've done, I pray that we be real with you, and Lord, and just enjoy this time of communion with each other. In Jesus' name, amen.